Okay. So we have um, made some changes from, say, even the folding chair from the 1930s. We've got them lighter. We've got them now rigid so that they're not taking all the flex in the chair. And, and I think partly these are because people are expecting more from their chair. We have people with disabilities out in society now doing things, expecting to do things of work and life and recreation. In the power mobility, you know, I think biggest changes are probably in their battery life and types of software programming that you have there. So it's, we're working and it's a slow progress, but is, we still have this prevalence of overuse injuries. So is something like the lever-driven wheelchair, I don't know if you've ever seen one, or do you ever have them, do you prescribe them here? They're, the, I don't find it's, personally I find it a little awkward still, but at least in this design these levers can tuck away quite easily and you can disengage the levers and use the normal push rim quite easily. So, you know, maybe there's something to it and, and when I see people using the lever, lever drive system, they actually are amazing in going up hills and things that you probably would work way harder in pushing up a rim with using your rims. The, we still have huge problems with pressure sores and spasms and postural things that we need to continue to work with. And I don't know if the chair is ever going to address those. Are we going to be able to make major advances in the chair? I still hope so. But I think one of the things, one of our biggest challenges that we're going to be facing and even are facing is people with disabilities are aging. So our standard spinal cord population is now getting older. And I met a bunch of these guys when they were in their you know, mid-30s, you know, 40 years old, and suddenly now they're 50s and mid-50s. And they're like, Bonnie, my body hurts everywhere. You know, I, I don't want to use a power chair, but I really don't know what to do anymore. And so now they're getting a van with a lift, so at least they're not hauling their chair in their car. Some of them have been thinking about a power chair, but they don't really want that, you know, and I totally understand because I revolted for a long time as well. And also, we're, we have 40% of our newly acquired spinal cord injury are now over the age of 55. I don't know what your, your incidence is here, but it's actually kind of surprising. Um, you know, with the increase of older people living on their own, on their own longer and uh, with osteoporosis and some of the other issues and also still the people that think they're, you know, in their 40s and they're now in their 60s acting like, um, we won't say anything, but um, <laughs> injuring themselves, doing crazy things. And, and, and it's unfortunate, but we got, we're getting the aging disabled population. So what do we need to do about them? How are we going to educate? I think we need to educate the younger um, spinal cord injured much earlier about they're going to live a long time. So what are you going to do about it? Yes, you can push and burn, and then you're going to have screwed up shoulders. You won't be able to transfer. You won't be able to reach high objects. You won't be able to do all these things. Can we teach them some sort of behavior that allows them to still have the, the power to be in their manual chair for longer, giving them the option to having a power chair sometimes? Is that, the, you know, is that something? And unfortunately, you get the issue of you know, funding bodies saying, You're, that's abandonment. They'll never use that chair. It's just going to sit in their garage. But if we could teach them the benefits, or can, I've actually got a chair where, well, it's the same, it's the same chair. I pop these wheels on. I put the power wheels on. And they're, it's actually got a little joystick. And it turns into a power chair without me actually looking any different. You know, and I think, you know, we struggle with how we look and we don't want to move into that power chair look. At GF Strong, where I come from, there's the Walker Club and the Man in Wheelchair Club and the Power User Club. And, you know, it's, you, you try not to be in the Power User Club. <laughs> but the irony of it is, is that they, the walking club fatigue easy and they can't go nearly as far as manual wheelchair users and then the manual wheelchair users they hang on to those power users when they want to go up a hill 
So it's like you, you're a bit hypocritical, <laughs> saying you don't want to be in a power chair when you're actually benefiting from it. And so what do we do? We also were looking at um, return to work. And we found that um, people who are walkers oft in, with spinal cord injury often don't do as well at returning to work as, say, people in manual wheelchair users because they fatigue so much faster. And so they have a harder time actually integrating back into work than those in a manual wheelchair. And I think we need to consider all these options when we're educating newly injured about just how they're going to manage a lifelong of with a spinal cord injury and with a disability. So I think we need to keep learning what we, you know, learn from the kids some of their behaviors. I think we can actually learn from them for a change. And then also learn um, how we're going to keep our, our, our wheelchair users surviving longer in the community and, and without burning themselves out and requiring a lot of um, expensive help later on. So we, and we need to teach people skills, how to use their chair. I think that's really critical. So I'm still working on lots of things, and um, I think we've got a long ways to go in, in our wheelchair research, but I also don't, I can't quite envision what that future wheelchair will look like. But um, thanks for having me.